Marissa Norcross. And I'm Dave Freund, and this is The Next Page. Marissa, how are you? I'm fantastic. How are you? Oh, fantastic. That's good. I'm terrific. I'm not fantastic. <laughs> you can be fantastic. I'll be terrific. But I'm, I'm doing well. Thank you. Good. You know, it's... So this is midday. Actually, this is like early afternoon. This is when I'm... So if we if we would go by Daniel Pink's book When, mm-hmm. this is not a good time for me. So if I fall asleep, you might have to just say, Dave, could you please wake up? No, because I am I am more of a lark. I'm more of a morning person, and I hit my low right about now. But but podcasts always seem to inspire me. Well, you know, I've got about so. thirty minutes left until I start sliding into to, that slump, and then I come back up in the evening. So isn't it yeah, interesting? Too. Like when you know. When you know, it makes it so much yes. easier because you can say like, okay, I'm entering my, like, this is when I need to do certain types of work or like, I right. know if I do something creative right now, it'll bring me back up. Um, yep. And I think for so exactly. long, I used to just think like, oh, there's something wrong with me once two o'clock hits, but no, it's just, I need to adjust. It, 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 you just need, you just need to adjust what you're working on mm-hmm. to be able to re-inspire your brain. Or sometimes you can, and sometimes you may just need to do some, some admin kind of work, you yeah. know, some clerical functions, some detail, process some emails because you just don't have the energy to do the other stuff. But we've got energy now. At least I know I have 30 minutes and the podcast is never longer than 30 minutes. <laughs> so, um, once again, now he belongs to the ages. Yeah. So when I wrote, when you saw the title, did you remember where it came from? I did. I remembered that we ah. had done a podcast with a similar title about Abraham Lincoln. Abraham Lincoln, yes. And it's interesting. There is actually some some controversy. So I always thought that it was Seward that said that, mm-hmm. and and I could find evidence that that uh, Secretary of State Seward said that, but I also found some some historians that believe that the secretary of defense Stanton said that. So anyways, well, I'm not, I'm not useful in in telling you which one did or didn't (laughs) tell me that. (laughs) Although one of these days I I do need to go to the Seward house in Auburn. Yeah. I think that would be fascinating. Mm -hmm. You know, um, uh, engineer Tim's been there. Um, and he said, it's pretty amazing. Mm -hmm. So I think, I think I would like to do that. But so this is really, um, kind of a way of, of, um, remembering the passing of, of, I don't know if you call him General Powell, Secretary of State, but Colin Powell passed away mm-hmm. um, last week. And, and it really caused me to pause. Um, he, you know, I first remember seeing him or hearing about him during the, the first Gulf War when, when the Iraqis had pushed their way into Kuwait and it was General Powell and uh, Norman Schwarzkopf were on TV almost daily telling us what was happening. And, mm-hmm. and, and, and so that was the first exposure that I had to him. And then as I, you know, as I remember um, my history and, and also reading the book that, that I just finished, The Three Days in Moscow, um, we'll remember, our listeners will remember that when Ronald Reagan had to insist that a statement be left out of an agreement, it was Colin Powell that slides a note to President Reagan that says, Mr. President, this is why you can't allow this to be in there. Mm-hmm. Um, so here was a man that, and, and so I, I did a little bit of research, and I will go through all 13 of his rules of leadership because they're, they're really great. Um, so he was, uh, he was in Vietnam. He was injured in Vietnam. Um, he came back home. After he recuperated, he went back to Vietnam. So it's interesting, wounded twice in Vietnam. Um, but he goes into, um, and I don't remember where it was. It was somewhere in the South. He goes to like um, a takeout food kind of place, um, a, like a burger joint, burgers and hot dogs. And he tries to order a hot dog. And the woman behind the counter says, I'm sorry, sir, I can't serve you. Wow. Wow. And he said, what? And she goes, listen, I'm from New Jersey, and I don't understand this either. She said, if you want to come around back, I'd be happy to serve you. But she couldn't serve him because he was black. Mm. He had been wounded in two tours of duty in Vietnam, but he couldn't order a hot dog somewhere in the South. 
And then he said that about five months, and he says, no, ma'am, I don't need to go through the back. I'll just walk to the base and get something to eat. About five months later, there was a law that was passed, and I forgot what the name of the law was, but that basically they had to serve servicemen, you know, uh, regardless of their race. And then he went back in and he was able to get his hot dog or hamburger. But it just, it startled me to think of a man that had given so much to our country had to endure such horrible discrimination. Um, and so, but he never, you know, he, he never was bitter about it type of thing. And so, so just to give some background for the folks before we jump into the 13 rules of leadership, he served four U.S. presidents. Now, I don't think he served President Clinton long, but he started out serving President Reagan. Uh, he was the assistant national security advisor. And then when Frank Carlucci was promoted, um, it was interesting, uh, Colonel Powell, or General Powell, said um, he's sitting in the in a room giving a briefing or something, and he says all of a sudden Carlucci walks in and the president walks in and they sit down at the end of the table and in the middle of this meeting and they slide him a note that says you are now the national security advisor to the president. So Carlucci was promoted and that's how he found out about his promotion. But all the time, all he wanted to do is go back and 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 work in the army. But he just kept being challenged with more and more opportunities. And so another quick, really quick story. So when he's uh, when he was offered the job as assistant to the National Security Advisor, Carlucci calls him and he says to Carlucci, he goes, listen, I don't want to do it. No, but the president really needs you. And he says, if the president needs me, the president should call me. He said 15 to 30 minutes later, the phone rings. And who's on the other end of the phone? The president. And he said, as a good soldier, I just stood up, I sat up square in my chair and said, yes, sir, when should I come? Even though he didn't want the job. Um, because when duty calls, great American heroes answer the call. So he served the Reagan administration. He served in the Bush 41 administration. He, there was, as the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, so he was the first black chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. He was the first black secretary of state under Bush 43. There was an overlap um, into the into the Clinton administration when he was chairman of the Joint Chiefs. He was a four star general. Um, and I, so I guess you, the title you finish up with is the one that you go by. So it would be secretary of state Colin Powell. He, so and he he also blazed the trail for Condoleezza Rice, who became the first black woman. Secretary of State. And I also heard a very interesting one where Dana Perino, who was George W. Bush's press secretary, um, was standing next to him at some point. She was a junior staffer somewhere in the White House when um, Hamid Karzai, who was the Afghan leader, was... So, no, she must have been Bush's press secretary at that point. He, she's standing in the back of the room. She just happened to be standing next to Colin Powell. And Karzai was giving some wonderful speech. And she says to Hamid Kar, uh, she says to Colin Powell, wow, he's, you know, he's such a great speaker. And, and Powell said something along the lines of this. It's amazing how someone can have such a great speech when deep down inside they're just a dictator. So he knew, so he could just sense that Karzai was not the person he was presenting himself to be. And it was just that that ability to discern was just amazing. Um, do do you have any? I mean, you're you are so young that you weren't around when a lot of these things took place. Do you have any recollections of hearing about Colin Powell? Yes, I I remember him from the Bush forty three administration. Okay, so I, yep. you know I I was not around for the Reagan administration. <laughs> right. Um, right. <laughs> I guess I think or much of the Bush 41 exactly or much so. of the Bush 41 um I remember very little about the Clinton administration but um I do remember him from Bush 43 Yeah and he you know he he so there's if you do searches there's a lot of critics that say he was a liar he was he was the one that was tasked with with convincing the world that uh Saddam Hussein had weapons of mass destruction mm -hmm. and and he presented the case as he was given it with the evidence he was given 
very convincingly, the problem was the evidence he was given wasn't accurate. Mm -hmm. The whole world thought Saddam Hussein had weapons of mass destruction. In fact, he didn't. He just wanted us to believe he did as a way of threatening the world. Um, so right or wrong, you know, it was bad, it was bad intelligence, and, mm -hmm. and Colin Powell was the one that had to present it. Um, and he regretted it. He regretted the fact that he got bad data, but it was the data that he was given, and he did a masterful job of presenting it. Mm -hmm. So his 13 laws of rules of leadership. So the first one, that, and these were four that I put in my writing, it ain't as bad as you think. It will look better in the morning. Mm -hmm. Such good advice. You know, it, it's like the other quote, yesterday ended last night. Get over it. Mm hmm yeah, I, move on. I always like to think, you know, the, the sun will rise again tomorrow. It will. It will. Even if it's cloudy and gray, the sun mm -hmm. still rose. We just didn't see it. Mm -hmm. and, and then I love number two, get mad and get over it. <laughs> which, mm -hmm. which is really such good advice. Because mm -hmm. if you don't get mad, it will, it, it will come out. If you don't process those emotions, they will come out at the wrong time. Exactly. And if you don't say it, you're going to act it out. And mm -hmm. so just kind of process those through, get over it. Mm -hmm. And then I'm sure you weren't surprised with number three that I picked, it can be done. No, that one did not because surprise often, me at all. Because <laughs> I've often said, it's, you know, you have to move beyond I can or I can't to how can I. Mm -hmm. um, my dad used to say, who, he who says it can't be done is often interrupted by somebody doing it. Mm -hmm. So it can be done. Anything can be done be done and here's a man who wasn't allowed to get a burger or a hot dog mm -hmm. he was the son of jamaican immigrants born in harlem raised in the bronx a c student that was accepted at, at to a college in new york city you know he says i was a c student that was it mm -hmm. but he rose to being one of the most powerful men in the world he could have run for president had he run for president in 1999 George W. Bush would not have run. And everybody says Colin Powell probably would have won the election. Wow. I didn't know that. Because he was that powerful. He was that. And, and it took him a while. He was recruited by the Republican Party to run for president. Um, and, it, and he said, oh, I remember the day that I finally woke up and I realized, no, this isn't me. And he said, I went downstairs to talk to my wife, Alma, who was making breakfast. And she, he said to her, I told her, I said, Alma. I'm not going to do it. She goes, what took you so long? I knew you weren't going to do it. It's <laughs> funny. Number four, perpetual optimism is a force multiplier. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. People who have, who have an optimistic mindset and, and are filled with hope are unstoppable. And our teams. So there, this was a great quote. Um, believe in your purpose. Believe in yourself. Believe in your people, and they will believe in you. That's just, that's, that's leadership at its highest level. Mm -hmm. So now let's get into the ones that I didn't put in there. Um, avoid having your ego so close to your position that when your position fails, your ego goes with it. Ooh. Ooh. Yeah. You know, our position, our title, is not who we are. Mm -hmm. And it's not the title that makes the leader. It's not the position that makes the leader. It's the leader that makes the position. Mm -hmm. And I think what he's saying is you got to know who you are. Mm -hmm. And you got to stay humble. And you need to accept the fact that, you know, there are going to be people that are going to dislike you. And they're going to write all kinds of horrible things about you. But it doesn't define who you are. Uh, here's one. Be careful what you choose. Don't rush into a bad situation. Take time to consider your options. Weigh the relevant facts and make reasoned assumptions. Once you've pulled the trigger, there are no do-overs, so make it count. You know, that's, I, I think it was John Wooden that said, um, be careful with all the decisions that you make in life because the decisions end up making you. He said it much more eloquently than that. Um, but it's true. Now, I also heard a quote once of, of Powell that said, if you have like 60% or 65% of the information, you have to make a decision because you're never going to have 100% of what you need. 
Don't let adverse facts stand in the way of a good decision. Hmm. He was fond of connecting good leadership to good instincts, but as a leader who who hones judgment and instinct, take time to shape your mental models. Learn how to read a situation for yourself. Become the decision maker your people need you to be. Wow. Our teams are looking for us to make decisions. Yep. And we can't just say, oh, well, I'm not ready yet. No, you don't really have a choice. you got to make a decision if you're a leader. Mm -hmm. Decisive action. Decisive action. You know, I, I, there used to be a quote um, that I used to use in some of the training, lead, follow, or get out of the way. <laughs> um, here's a good one. You can't make someone else's choices. Yeah, that's a good one. Wow. And... And we also can't, so people, people are going to make bad choices. Mm -hmm. And all we can do is advise them. And, and if we see something happening, warn them. But it's their choice, and they're going to have to live with the consequences. And they have to own those consequences. You know, you know just, just saying, well, so-and-so is making some bad decisions. We can't excuse that. We have to just say, listen. Do you realize the choices that you're making are actually affecting your future? Mm -hmm. Now, I'm happy to help you make better choices, but you have to walk that journey. I can't do it for you. Number eight, check the small things. Success is built on a lot of seemingly minor details. Mm -hmm. Having a feel for those little things is essential. Wow. It's all those little details that are critical for success. Mm -hmm. I think it's the, the little details are what are closest to your values. And I think that's why ah, they're yes. so important. I love that. Yeah, they're closest to your values. Very good. Share the credit. Number nine, success relies on the effort of an entire team, not just the leader. Mm -hmm. Recognition motivates people in the ways that are immeasurable. And don't be a glory hog. So while, wow. you know, and here was a man that, and, and so I, I did, I watched a couple interviews with him. That's one of the beauties of YouTube. I mean, I know that, you know, we're, we're all complaining about big tech and, and I, 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 I think they're doing some horrible things, but there are some really amazing things out there if you just know where to look. And mm -hmm. there's a series of interviews with, with Secretary Powell. And it was just so inspiring to see a man who was so powerful and yet so unassuming you know he he talked about one one example he said when he was secretary of state there was a new foreign minister for spain and this woman calls his office and says i need your help we're having a disagreement about an island in the atlantic or something and so there was some other country that was awful, and I don't know which country it was, was upset with Spain and was challenging them to the sovereignty of an island. And he said, it didn't matter to the United States national interest at all. But he said they were an ally, they were a friend, and they needed somebody to help. So I had a conversation with them. You know, and he, it, so it didn't matter who it was. If they needed something, he was there. And he wasn't going to take the credit for things that were done. He, you know, he was always going to share credit. Somebody asked him if he thought that the, the operation uh, to clear out Kuwait, I don't know what we would have called that, the first Gulf War, if he was ever concerned that it would not have been a decisive victory. He goes, no, I was never concerned. Because he said, I always prepared for a decisive he said the goal was always to have supreme power and force so that your outcome was almost guaranteed. Mm -hmm. You know, but it was always the troops that did it. It was somebody else that did it. It wasn't his planning. Uh, number 10, remain calm and be kind. And that was something that I, that I saw was really evident in him. Just, just in the way he spoke, there was this kindness. There was... He was a like a kind and gentle man, even though at one point he had over a million army um, folks under his command. Imagine that, a million men under your command, wow. men and women. Wow. Um, keep calm, carry on, kill them with kindness. 
When mm-hmm. chaos reigns, a calm head and a kind word go a long way. Mm-hmm. When everyone is under incredible stress, be the leader people want to follow, not the leader people want to avoid. Wow, that's huge. I need to highlight that. That's going to be in one of my trainings. Yeah. That was a great way of putting that. Mm-hmm. How about this one? Have a vision and be demanding. Followers need to need to followers need things from leaders. They need this purpose. They need the vision. They mm-hmm. need the the standards to be set by the leader. When leaders fail, it's almost always for one of those two things that they don't have the purpose and the vision mm-hmm. for the team. And really, you know, you have to demand people to to pursue the vision and the dream. If they're on the team, they've got to move in that direction. The last one that we haven't talked about, don't take counsel of your fears or naysayers. Yeah. Fear can be a powerful motivator, but it can also paralyze a leader at the worst possible times. Learn to understand your fears Mm -hmm. and channel them in ways that you control rather than allowing them to control you, which Mm -hmm. gets us back to, you know, fears are a product of our thought life. Right. I was just going to mention that. (laughs) Yep. Think clearly, think rationally, and make mm-hmm. decisions that aren't rooted in emotion. Mm-hmm. Wow. And so, you know, if you think about the decisions he had to make that were life and death situations for so many, mm-hmm. he really had to believe that he had the right information and the right vision and the right purpose. Mm-hmm. So that was Secretary Powell, somebody very special Mm -hmm. that impacted so many people now there will be people that will complain about some of his political views there will be people that complain about who he decided to vote for and who he decided to endorse but he was an amazing man and then after retiring from public life he and his wife started a, a nonprofit that was all about engaging people in their communities to do volunteer service oh wow Something like American Promise or something like that. It's I didn't amazing. write that down. Yeah. You know, yeah. I, I didn't realize the extent of his career. I mean, like I said, I you know, only remember the final of the four administrations that he served. But right. um, wow, like just what a lengthy career and impressive. Exactly. Mm-hmm. For a man that never really wanted to be in the limelight. I mean, mm-hmm. one of the first photographs that I saw of him as an adult He's actually uh, being recognized by President Nixon for something. Mm -hmm. So that would have had to have been sometime between 1968 and 1974. Wow. Or 75. So, yeah, he was was a a public servant from day one. Mm Mm-hmm. Just a a real testimony to what can be done if you work hard. Yeah. And I love the fact that he stressed, I was a C student. Mm-hmm. And now a major part of that school is named after him. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm so my, glad that yeah. you, you're sharing all of this. I mean, I, I, I'm sure I'm not the only one who, who doesn't know all of this. And it's really quite the legacy to leave behind. It is. You know, and, and what, I, what I really liked was he... He pursued what he believed to be right Mm -hmm. and made tremendous sacrifices, sacrificed so much of his family life and his family time for that. Mm -hmm. Um, He did talk about, you know, um, getting married, um, wife is expecting, and he's shipped off, you know, and then he comes back and meets the baby that he's never seen. You know, um, I can't comprehend that. No. But there were people that made these, and there are still people that make those sacrifices for our country every day. Mm -hmm. And we just need to really hold them in very, very high esteem. Mm -hmm. So, next week, redemption. Okay. So just throw that out as a, whether that's the real title of the podcast or whether that's what the podcast is about, I'm not sure yet. You can help me with that one when we get a little (laughs) bit closer to 
to, to, to releasing it, but that's what it's about. Sounds good. So, you know, our autumn is in full swing. Yes. It, you know, it took a little bit to get here, but it did. But, um, yes, now I'm, I'm in the spirit. <laughs> anything, anything special this weekend coming up? Uh, well, I haven't completely decided yet, but I think we're finally inching towards what I like to call pie season. Because it, it's, Ooh, it's felt too warm love it. for pie lately. It did. So it did. Now I think um, it's it's time to do that. Mm. How about pie. you? Pie. Love pies. So, yeah, I think there's just some chores that, that need to happen. Um, the old boat needs to be winterized. I'll, I'll do mm-hmm. that Saturday morning. God willing, and I'm able. Um, yeah, and then maybe I got to go find a place to get a pie. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> My wife is a strudel baker. Not She doesn't do pies a lot. Mm-hmm. She does, but she's strudel is where she's at, is yeah. my favorite Austrian. Mm-hmm. So, well, I wish you the best. Um, and so until next week, I'm Dave Freund. I'm Marissa Norcross. This was The Next Big Adventure.